and welcome to TypeCal from home. And uh, on behalf of the TypeCal uh, from home and the TypeCal team uh, that is based in Kuwait but has connections all over the planet, um, tonight for us is a really um, auspicious moment um, as we will be introducing um, Huda Arifaris very soon. Uh, and it also marks uh, the one year anniversary. So I'd just like to kind of take us uh, back. It seems like a really long time ago. Uh, and uh, just to uh, share with you the TypeCal journey and what we hope that we will be um, able to continue to offer to the community of design, typography, and calligraphy. So March 7th, 2019 um, marked the culmination of efforts and an objective to bring to light the importance of typography and calligraphy specifically to our region. It was a summation of months of preparation with a student and teacher driven program that resulted in the first symposium of its kind here in Kuwait and to serve design students, professionals and the creative industry in the region. The symposium was held at DAI Yarmouk and it was kicked off uh, by Farid Abdal as he shared his process with calligraphy from within. Over the course of three days of talks and workshops, showcasing diverse viewpoints that focused on the craft, process, design thinking, and how intersections reflected the importance of multi-language design and calligraphy then and now more than ever. Our intention was to have the second symposium take place in March of 2021 with the theme of parallels as our guiding compass. Senior graphic design students at AUK, Jamana Khalil and Hussein Boalayan created a winning design from amongst many other students as can be seen on our updated and refreshed website, typecal.com. And we welcome you to visit typecal.com on a regular um, basis as we add events and we evolve. C19, as we call it, created the disruption and forced the team to reflect deeply and to pivot on how TypeCal could better serve the community at the time. Discussions ensued and the initial idea germinated to begin with where we had left off. With those contributors at our first symposium, to share their insights, approaches, studios, and the reflections that became a series of talks called TypeCal from Home. As the situation evolved, so did the talks that also included several workshops from concerted practice with Paul Antonio and glyphs with Rainer Scheichelbauer. Fast forward and June 20, 21, um, marked our first anniversary for TypeCal from home. And we want to thank all of the students, volunteers, faculty at AUK, AUK Art and Design and Chair William Anderson, Clark Stokely, many other of the faculty, as well as our very, very generous guest speakers to um, American University of Kuwait and to uh, Yadawi as our community and academic sponsors. A special thank you to my colleague, Maryam Hussainia, co-founder and a driving force, an incredible colleague in this journey. Marking our anniversary and the last Type Cal from Home talk this season, a warm welcome to our guest speaker, Huda, Ms. Trishzen Abifaris. And I'd like to talk a little bit about the Chalk Foundation, which was founded in 2004 at the dawn of a new Arab design it was set up as an independent research platform with the aim of advancing design research and development in the region. This talk will present a selection of projects of the Huck Foundation, such as the typographic matchmaking design research projects from 2005 to 2017, the Nomadic Traces Traveling Exhibition from 2016 to 2021, and ongoing publishing projects, the Arabic Design Library, series of design monographs published by Hutt Books since 2016. The talk will address the importance of design research as an act of political engagement, will explore the potentials of collaborative multi-script typographic research and its contribution to cultural development, and empowerment. 
and will also highlight the importance of documenting and presenting an alternative design history from parts of the world that are rarely covered in the international and mainstream design scene. Please, a warm welcome to Huda. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Now I don't have much to say anymore. <laughs> so I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen soon, but I wanted to welcome everybody also and that, that are here. Thank you for, for attending. And, um, and I would like to make this presentation a little bit informal. So I will show some projects and but I would love to have like an open discussion with you in the end. So I'd like to hear your opinions, not just questions, but also like that we have a conversation. So it's wonderful that, you know, everybody that's joining is most people that are joining, I don't know. So that's kind of nice. Um, and also that you come from different parts of the Arab world or the world. So that's also a really um, wonderful thing. So, okay, so I'm going to start with um, showing you my first slides. <coughs> and, um, try not to um, uh, confuse you too much with my talk. Okay, so, the, so I thought, you know, I would focus on this um, one aspect that, um, that one aspect of what we do, which is looking at you know, the, the bilingualism or the multilingualism that we have in the Arab world and how that is represented in typography and graphic design. Um, um, the typographic matchmaking projects that Lubna uh, mentioned were focused on that issue, but there's also other projects I will show that have uh, in a way that that is implied in the design, but that is not the focus of the design. Um, <clears throat> So I'd like to start by just showing you two slides, which is, you know, my journey into Arabic typography started with this book that I wrote in 2001. And the reason I made this book was, you know, um, having to do with the fact that I was teaching and I was now teaching tools on Arabic culture in graphic design. So all our tools were about Western design and it felt a little bit like we were missing something. And so I had to um, do some research for myself to be able to teach my students. And then it turned out to be a book. Um, and the book was really, uh, for me, an eye opener because all of a sudden, you know, I, I like many people probably in, in the Arab world, I studied in, in the US and then I came to teach in the Arab world. I worked in Europe and then came back to the Arab world to teach. Um, and I was teaching in AUB. So I was kind of in, a little bit myself, a little bit kind of in two worlds. And I realized that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so I did this research. And then eventually, you know, this kind of started my whole interest in Arabic typography and my interest in how to create tools for Arab designers, for myself and my students and all other designers um, to be able to create work that has a connection to the culture that is kind of grounded in our societies, but that's also not, you know, not in a fetishizing way, not in like just kind of uh, looking at the history, but looking at lessons from history that we can apply to contemporary design. Anyway, the book was around in 2001 and, um, you know, it eventually it ran out of print. And so, um, so the, the, green, uh, the green cover is the new version of this or the new revised edition. And it was also a moment that was difficult to decide, you know, how do you revise a new book like that? Because in these past 20 years, so much has happened in design. Um, so it was very interesting to kind of, you know, restrain myself and say, no, I'm not going to make a totally new book. I'm not going to try to add what is happening today because that's a book by itself. So it's a kind of, um, it was interesting to kind of look back at this history and see also for me as a, as, an, as, a, as a researcher, what I have learned over the 20 years and kind of revise this information without expanding the period. So the book ends in 2000 and it still ends in 2000, but everything exciting happened in typography in the Arab world after 2000. So they kind of, um, important to keep 
I felt that it was important to keep this, this historical document as it is and not add to it and change it into something else. Um, especially that we have done many books since, so there was no reason to kind of repeat information. Um, Lubna introduced the Khat Foundation, and you probably know a little bit about it, but basically it's, an, it's a virtual center it's, has a, that has existed online. It was, the, it was When we set it up in 2004, it was unique. It was kind of partly a presentation uh, space for designers and also kind of a social community. So it was like, a, in a way, a combination of what has become um, other things like Facebook and Instagram and all these other new social media. Um, so for us, it was an interesting way as a tool to bring designers together, but also to kind of learn about each other and, and meet each other, and then also provide a source of information about who is doing what, what they are doing, and so forth. So the website was, is the center. Um, and then from there we developed, you know, our first project in real life was the, uh, the Khat Foundation. We did a conference in Dubai called Kitabat, Arabic Calligraphy and Typography Conference, where we brought together graphic designers, illust um, calligraphers and um, type designers. And that was an, also a very interesting moment to be in Dubai at the time. Um, and we did it at the American University in Dubai, where I was the chair, so it was also easier for me to, to host such an event. So I was kind of living already in two worlds between Dubai and the, and, uh, the Netherlands. Um, then we, based on these events, we also started to make lots of workshops, and we did workshops with various institutions, cultural institutions, small and big, around the Arab world. Um, so this is a little bit a very like brief description of what we do. And then uh, one of our projects, which I will talk about later, became, you know, kind of we needed to start publishing based on that. So we set up a publishing house in 2010 and we started to kind of publish at the beginning uh, research projects that we were involved in. But eventually it became also a little bit of a smaller independent publishing house where we focused totally on design and visual culture from the Arab world um, and, uh, and, and the Middle East, wider, a bit wider Middle East. Uh, and, and it's been for us like an extension of, of the mission of the foundation. So what we do, we document, which I think um, is also an important thing that I would like to talk about today, the importance of, of keeping record, because we always, we live in societies that are so constantly changing, and we have the tendency to be obsessed with the new, which is a good thing, but we always, by doing that, we often erase the past, and that we always, it always feels like we are always building from scratch every time, instead of building on you know, the existing knowledge and, and being able to be inspired by the existing knowledge and going forward from it. Um, it's also important that, so we don't, because of this, like most Arab, most Arab designers don't know much about our own history, um, but also the rest of the world does know about our own history. And I think that everybody knows today that we all kind of self-conscious about the fact that it's important to be exclusive. The design di di discussions and dialogues have to be totally global. I mean, it's not enough that we exchange goods and sell and, and collaborate on projects. We also have to understand each other and, and understanding each other through the way we express ourselves is a very good way to also creating a little bit more peace between people and maybe reduce a little bit the racism that is growing around us. So these things are all important issues and we try to, to create next to this historical research and documenting also the platform in this publishing house for innovative books and innovative visions by young authors when it's possible. So it's a growing publishing house, it's small, uh, we've been around for only 10 years and we, we, we make books we think are important to make. It's not very commercial in the sense we're not trying to make lots of books so that we can make lots of money, uh, but more make books that are worth, worth existing in this world. Um, and then I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the typographic matchmaking. I hope it's like, um, I, I will talk not so long so that we have room for um, for questions later. The typographic matchmaking 
project started in 2004. And the idea was that as a designer, as a, as a typographer, as a graphic designer myself and with my students, I always felt that we didn't have enough good quality fonts, that didn't, the fonts that existed were kind of digitized designs that were happened in the 1950s or 60s or 70s. So they felt a little bit out of sync with the time. Um, and also, you know, how do you, when you create bilingual publications or bilingual design, how do you make a kind of, how do you, how do you work, you know, when the two fonts come from different worlds, like completely aesthetically in this um, so, so we started with this idea, like, let's, let's try and make, um, let's try and address this problem. And let's try and look through also as a, as a, as a, as a foundation, how can I curate an ex a project like this that is not just about creating fonts, but it's also about, you know, looking at the, the wider implications of what you do when you create new typefaces, when you are innovative with calligraphy, how do we bring people together? What are the discussions that should happen? Should there be an exchange of um, skills? Should there be an exchange about, you know, what are these cultures about? Because writing systems are very much about at the core of culture. Um, we all attach to them, you know, they reflect how we think, they reflect what we have to say. So they are important to everybody. And so when you, when you work with that and you try to innovate within that context, it's very important to be sensitive. Um, so we, we started with this project in 2005 and it was a two year project and I will talk about it. And then we had uh, a team of five designers, five Dutch, five uh, Arab. Um, then it was successful. So we did it the, the second time in 2008. So the first project had a team of 10 designers, if you want, all together. The, the group was 10 people making five fonts in Arabic only. The second time around, we got more ambitious. We, did, we decided to have a bigger team. So we had uh, 15 designers that included um, graphic designers, uh, type designers, and uh, architects, because we were doing something for the built environment. And then we produced again, five font families in two, in two scripts. So it was actually a lot more fonts to design. And then the last time we did this project in 2015, 2017, we had a smaller team, but the team was three people also. So we had three, nine designers altogether, actually seven, seven? yeah, seven designers. Um, and they designed three different scripts. And then in three ways. So the, 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 there's a variety in, in the way it was approached. And I will tell you a little bit more about them. So, um, so the first typographic matchmaking was really simple. And we produced at the end of it. So we had to only design the Arabic. But there was a lot of discussion about how to do that. And I'll show you some very quickly some samples. And we produced a publication with a CD on it. Uh, of the beta fonts, because we felt that it was important since it was publicly funded that this returns to the public in some way and that people can be able to play and, and experiment with it. And we also, when we launched the project, we produced uh, an exhibition and then, you know, some um, 10 years later, we decided to document, you know, the process of making that exhibition, which turned out to be a book called Hema Graphic Design for Social Change. So the, the, the most important thing, and I will zoom a little bit to see for you to see the sketches. So in this, in this idea was to have a conversation between the two, de two designers. So they were working on the Arabic script, but they were also trying to understand how this Arabic script or how this Arabic version of this font can still relate to the original Latin without actually, you know, and still remain Arabic and readable. So this is a discussion that was happening between Lucas de Groot and uh, Munir Sharani, who's a well-known Syrian um, calligrapher, who actually was very much from the generation that believed that any um, Arabic uh, typography should actually be very geometrical because that's different than calligraphy. In his mind, there was no way to mix the two. It was almost... You, you do very uh, drawn lettering 
for type and you do calligraphy that's more freehand and much more fluid. So this was the result of their of their thing. And I think that in a way, this was one of the one of the very successful fonts, which eventually became a bigger family. And the relationship between these two people continued. For me, that's very important in a collaboration that it doesn't end once the project ends, but that the people that are working on this find it as a way to continue working together and to continue developing in collaborative and, and uh, creative work. Um, the other, um, you know, there's more examples, but I'm just going to stick to these three just briefly to show you the difference in approaches. So one team, which was Tarja Atrisi and um, Peter Bilat, they looked at, you know, they looked at the attitude of the font. So the Latin font had something like informal. And so they looked at a way to create an informal Arabic and they used the Rukha as a stand, as a base for uh, creating that and they used people's handwriting to do that and of course you know in the end you know you, they always look at little details where things can match so that it looks a little bit you know that they have some connection to each other but the structure of the scripts were very different so when you read one font when you use the Arabic alone or you use the Latin alone they still wouldn't look like strange uh, like they were copied from somewhere that you know, like Frankenstein strange. In this team with Pascal Zorbi and Martin Mayor, they actually thought that the Arabic could be an equivalent to a Latin, to an Italic, because in Latin, the Italic has a bit more of a calligraphic feeling, and it's a bit more slanted. And so they worked with the Arabic as sort of looking at the Italics of that. And so when you combine it with a Roman or with the Italic, it still looks, you know, the Arabic has only one slant, one angle. Uh, the team of Lara Aswad and Fred Smeyers looked at more the tool of drawing. So they looked at how the original Latin was drawn, what was the tool, and they found that there was an equivalent of the same uh, pen in the Maghribi style script. And so they used the Maghribi style as a starting point for the Arabic. So no matter where, I mean, no matter where you start, the end result should have some kind of proportional symbiosis in the way so that you know they are they can work together on a page but they are also clearly can work apart perfectly fine so that was the first project <clears throat> and because it's the first and uh, <clears throat> at the time you know you couldn't have matching arabic uh, latin fonts nowadays most uh, most arabic fonts have a matching latin or uh, most Latin fonts have been matching Arabic. So there's that, that trend is, is everywhere. So if you are a young designer today, you think, yeah, what's the big deal? But at the time it was a big deal. And because we, we distributed these CDs uh, with the books so people could read about the research, could read the point of view of the designers, why they made things, how they made them, and then use it in their own way. And so it was very, it went viral. And it, um, it started a different thinking about how you could work with Arabic and, and how you can start to develop new fonts and kind of like give people courage to do that. And so you had, you know, people commissioning uh, um, some of the designers to work, for example, for Al Imarat Lyon, which is a, which was a kind of a youth oriented newspaper in Dubai um, and so forth. And then, you know, we still, we are a Dutch foundation. We're based in the Netherlands because it was easier to set up a foundation in the Netherlands and because I lived in the, partly in the Netherlands. Um, so we had to present also this project in the Netherlands. And then for that purpose, we decided to do a more cultural project where we did a one day symposium and an exhibition that was a kind of uh, based on the idea that you can come into the exhibition and not just look at things, but actually take them home with you. So we uh, thought it would be nice to take a very typical Dutch department store and make a fake Arab, Arab, Arabized version of it. And then people could come and like take, buy a t-shirt. And then, you know, when they walk in, the, in their neighborhood where there are Moroccan uh, people living there, they can ask them, what does this t-shirt say? And then it starts a conversation between people that normally don't talk to each other. So, okay, we did it, it was very successful. You can see in this picture, there were like people waiting to get in. And on the first day, we almost sold everything in the exhibition, which was a problem because we didn't want to sell everything. We wanted to have still an exhibition. And then it was in the news and so forth. So we got really a lot more than what we bargained for. Um, but 
having you know having a success is very important it was the first time we do it we just kind of like tried things and didn't know where it was going um that leads always to encouraging you to do something more ambitious and then came this project of doing the same idea but then applying it to environmental things so then you know when you use a monumental type in an environmental place um, you can think of material you can think of space you are a bit freer because you're not restricted by legibility of reading and so it was an, a very different approach and we had uh, we we succeeded in raising more money for it so we could do trips with the whole team together bring them to the middle east bring them to dubai to look at you know how the environment is and how people deal with text in the environment bring everybody to the netherlands and compare you know have a discussion about what works in the netherlands why does it work here and not in in dubai and vice versa and um and then the five teams you know again each came with their own with their own uh, solution to that to that problem, and what is interesting is that you know sometimes the solution is like very theoretical, and and sometimes the solution is also very simple. Um, for example, in this example, which I really like, is that the designers you know looked at uh, lettering that is traditionally um, made by architects for buildings in nineteen twenties in in the Netherlands. So there's a very specific style of lettering, almost an Art Nouveau. And then when they try to find, you know, or try to think like what could be an equivalent in the Arab world, of course, the Kufi script comes to mind first, but the Kufi script is very geometric. And so they wanted something that is somewhere like, and then they looked, you know, they went and visited the calligraphy museum in Sharjah, and then, you know, they came across the, the, the older, um, um, what well, we call it the Abbasid script, which is one of the oldest scripts of, of, of Kuf, or what we call Kufi style. And then that's a handwritten script. So then they looked at, you know, that was very interesting. All of a sudden, by putting these two scripts that have nothing to do with each other over, you know, that they're separated by continents, by periods of time, by uh, different kind of uh, aesthetics, Still, the fact that they were used for something large and monumental, they automatically had something in common. And that was very interesting. The scale worked, you know, in this, in this. And of course, you know, then they, they crafted it and they invented, you know, new forms and so forth. And, and they couldn't use all the older uh, calligraphic uh, shapes because some of them, you know, they don't, they're not in use anymore. So we wouldn't be able to read them. So there was a lot of creativity to be done. But what was interesting in, in this project, not like the previous one, Everybody was fascinated. Of course, the designers were fascinated by the wealth and variety of Arabic scripts that existed. And so they, want, they all started actually by saying, let's start with the Arabic and see what we can do in Latin to match it. So it kind of the, the conversation got reversed. And for me, that's always these, these moments where people have to discover things, like in, in, in a situation where you have an idea in your head, but you have to discover it and see where, where the research takes you and what you can make with it. So these are some examples. You know, again, these scripts were meant to be presented on large scale. So we had some renderings of how they can be applied to the public space, um, different kind of outdoor situations that kind of dictate. So for example, in this, in this font um, called the storyline, you know, the idea was that it was modular on a square, like, like as if it was on, on phones or screens. And then they explored, you know, the Arabic and the English. I mean, it's not readable. It's more like a graphic form. And then you can read it, but it's first it's a graphic form. And then the idea of it is that you can use it then, you know, on different materials. You can cut it in glass. You can extrude it into blocks. You can make sculptures out of it. So it was not any more about you know, reading the text, but actually living in it and experiencing it. And then trying to guess it, which is, which is part of the fun. So it's kind of fun. Then the third typographic matchmaking we did was a very different story um, based on you know, my experience of traveling in, in Morocco and discovering that there was um, yeah, a script that I didn't know before, which is the Tifina script that is uh, um, used for writing Amazigh languages. Um, and it has been revived not so long ago um, and had gained a kind of like address in Unicode. So it actually was becoming a, 
a script that people can write and use and learn. Um, and the first thing, your first experience with it is that you see it on a few official signs, on street signs, um, especially on highways in certain parts of Morocco and not in others. So I was very curious about it. And then I thought, ah, oh, this is really would be very nice to think about, you know, how do you bring this script that is already there in the environment used in a very haphazard way? You know, they have, they always use the Latin, all capitals condensed, for example, and the, the Maghribi script, which is a very specific, you know, a calligraphic style and for the Arabic. And then you have the Tifina, which is used almost like symbols and very geometrical and kind of like, minimal design, if, if we can say that. So I thought uh, the three have to be used together. And I understand they come from different cultures and maybe there's also a political issue where everybody wants to separate them in a way visually, but there's also something to be said about, no, they should be actually probably more harmonious because in, in Moroccan society, as far as I know, these, these, these cultures are harmonious and yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. And they are part of each other and they are always in conversation. So we started this project, which was very um, interesting in, in, in research because, you know, uh, I had also a lot, a lot, a lot of things to learn. And it was a very um, educational process because we kind of had a smaller team so we could travel more easily. And we did a lot of travels and we started in Morocco by actually having experts come and talk to us about the script, about you know the history of it, about the developments that are being done technologically to bring it you know, into uh, uh, the, the contemporary uh, design environment. Um, but there was not so many people still involved in it as designers. And because of the history between Morocco and, 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 and of course Spain, uh, or, or North, well, Morocco, especially in Spain, uh, we wanted to, the, the team became like half Moroccan or North African designers and half uh, Spanish designers. And what was very interesting is that you realize in this process that the cultures are actually closer, let's say, than when we were working with between the Dutch and the Arab. Uh, the, there was a bit more of a distance in, in cultural uh, yeah, norms and behavior. And this was far more gelling as a, as a, as a team. Um, so we worked on these. So this time we had, you know, three teams because it was uh, it, for all sorts of reasons, but it was a good, it was in the end turned out to be better because then you have a concentrated energy. And we had, you know, experts of different scripts in all the teams. Um, so we worked on the three languages together. And then the, the idea was to, you know, think about like, what are the differences between them? What are the things that bring them together closer? Um, and how, how we can, you know, understand their differences. And, and, and from the start, I said, we start with the Arabic as a starting point. But the Arabic kind of is like, if you think in, in terms of structure of a script, you know, the tifina, which is on the bottom here, is very geometrical, mono case. There's no upper and lower case. The Arabic is very, especially the, the, the Maghribi script is very dynamic and, and, and fluid. And then you have the, the, the Latin, which could be somewhere in between the two. So there was an interesting way of looking at like, how do you balance all these different characteristics of this, of this kind of script? Um, and this is a little uh, quick uh, image of, you know, the, the end result. So you have a team that worked on three different uh, possibilities, a very thin, so I show it here, very big, the very thin baseline. And then they dressed it with uh, either a stronger, um, like a horizontal contrast or a vertical contrast. So this was the idea also of, you know, playing with how Arabic has more of a, horizontal contrast, whereas the yeah, Latin has more vertical contrast. And then they applied these two differences to the all the three scripts. So sometimes the Latin looks a little bit quirky. Sometimes the Arabic looks a little bit quirky in a style. And that was part of the game. Um, the second team uh, with uh, Tupkal, Andre Valius, Salah, Elisi, and Juan Luis Blanco, they worked on a very pragmatic uh, design. So they wanted something that could be used like a modern version of all these three different uh, scripts that could be used together for very practical things. 
Um, and the last team worked uh, started from the work of the famous uh, Al Kandusi, the famous uh, 19th century Moroccan calligrapher, who's quite extravagant in his interpretations of all the possibilities of the Maghribi scripts. And they used his his work as a starting point and tried to find to create equivalence in the Latin and in the and the Tifina, inventing styles that are not quite, you know, they are there in history, but they are not quite used together as one family. And so the whole family, if I come closer now, you can see them maybe better, they're quite lively and and they they came up with a type system that will eventually end up with like um, 48 different styles. Uh, for this for this project, they only did uh, three styles um, in in three weights each. So actually, nine style nine nine fonts, if you want. Heather, um, can I ask you a question? That was um, that was quite amb quite ambitious. Yes. Can I ask you a question? Um, how much how long of a time did they have from research to execution? I think the the we had always two years time period. So it takes, and, and it's never enough, actually. But uh, it's good. That's why they're all beta versions, because often, you know, I, with all these fonts, uh, people continue working on them after we've finished. They continue as a team developing it and refining it and things, because you always have to test things. The research is what takes the most, part, most time, and it is um, because it's new for everyone. It's really... The most exciting part that, that that the designers want to work on also. So I think that's also um, what what's what kind of needs the time to do it. With all of these with all of these um, projects, we kind of, we we develop a book and a good documentation. This book for this project, for example, which was finished in technically in 2017, is still not finished. Um, it's still we're still working on it because there's a lot of basic research that has to be you know added or at least collected and properly edited um can i move on then from this project we we did an exhibition um and we called it nomadic traces and we did an exhibition for the public so it wasn't for these graphic designers or typographers so we wanted to include uh using the scripts uh, to be placed on other design items like clothing, like jewelry, like ceramics and so forth. So we had a very small uh, um, place in, the, well, not very small place, a small in uh, cultural institution in the middle of the Medina in Marrakesh where we could do this work. And we involved a lot of the artisans from the souk and we wanted it to be like a way to show people that typography is not something, you know, it's, it's part of everyday life. It was quite fun to do and quite a success. And then it became a kind of like traveling exhibition. So we repeated it in 2019 in Abu Dhabi, but this time it was, we did a special research on the existing ancient scripts because, you know, Tifinag doesn't make sense in the, in the Arab world, in, 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 in the Eastern Arab world. Um, so we looked at the ancient scripts that existed before Arabic and their connection to Arabic. And this was a kind of team of researchers. We you know, wrote a little text about it, collected the information, and then again, gave these older scripts to different kinds of designers to create product with. So this is a work in ceramics. Um, and then, you know, and, and there were other applications. There were also um, people doing furniture, jewelry, textile design, uh, fashion, uh, installation, art installations, using these, these scripts. Um, then we repeated part of this exhibition. We added a new, uh, a new item, which uh, a new designer, Hussein Azat, who was from Jordan when we did it in Amman Design Week, again, looking at Jordanian history of scripts. And recently it opened uh, the exhibition in, in mid of July and June, so a couple of weeks or two weeks ago a week ago in uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia as part of the scripts and calligraphy, a timeless journey exhibition that was kind of a, like a huge exhibition on calligraphy. And they had a section on uh, that we did on contemporary design. So looking at, and then for this, again, we added new designers and new uh, Saudi artists 
um, part of it. So it so the idea of the exhibition was also that it explores scripts and then you know the scripts of each region and then designers from that region and it changes every time and it adds you know it, it connects more and more closer to the context. Um, so this is a little example here. For example, you see an example from embroidery on on these big coats, uh, kimabayas. Um, that's that are in in kind of like uh, contemporary Arabic calligraphy, but then you also have jewelry that shows the Dadanitic script, which is you know pre nabatean uh, which is also again native to Saudi Arabia. So looking at also the materials, you know what do you use here? You see some images printed of the landscape here. You, you know she used pearls to kind of connect again to the pearling and the tradition in the Gulf. So the idea of these, of, these, of these exhibitions is to, again, take the writing and kind of bring back the tradition of Islamic art and, and design of applying text on everything, like on everything in life, from the way we live, the way we dress, what we eat, what we read, etc. So I think that was, uh, that's for me a way of, you know, again, looking at design as a way to connect it to heritage, but then still look at contemporary things. And the last thing I want to show you is the last project, which has to do with, again, documenting beyond just, you know, our projects, but looking at the history of design in the region. So we started this, you know, among other things that we published, this one is uh, the idea of instead of making a, a big history of design book, we decided to have monographs specifically on important pioneer designers that have worked, let's say, from the 1950s to the 1980s. Um, and look at their work and how it is, you know, in different countries, what were their specialties, but also how they reflect that country. So it was called the Arabic Design Library. One of the first series, the first one in the series was on Hilmi Tuni, who is a, a, an Egyptian illustrator and book designer. Um, the books are always bilingual. They have no back and front page. It's if you read it from the right, it's uh, you know it's one side is Arabic that moves into English, so they're woven into each other. So it has two sides. So it's at the same time two languages, and we look at you know the captions of all the illustrations and all the chapters. They have texts in in both languages, but also the captions are in both languages. So the images never repeat. You have only one one set of images that go across the book. And then here again, you know, you see, like, I'm so happy that I'm doing these books now in the 2000s, you know, 2000s, where I have choices of fonts that are bilingual, um, where I have uh, where I have software that can deal with two different languages. Because when I first made a book in Arabic uh, in, in 1990, I had to do the Arabic on one software and the English on one software and like put them together at the printer so they become one book. Um, I'm glad that is no longer a challenge. The second um, in the series is a book on Nasri Khattar, who was uh, an architect by training, but he was also interested in, in type and type design. And he created a type system called al Abshadi al Muhada, the Unified Arabic, with the idea that this, this kind of unified and disconnected Arabic is easier to teach for children and kind of spread, uh, Ill, you know, combat illiteracy in the Arab world. So you see some examples of how he imagined it would be used. So this is a book from 1950 for children. And he, it's very interesting that he shows his, his own typeface, but also like the traditional uh, handwritten nasr. And this is a little bit a book about his system and how he came about doing it. This book is on um, Al uh, Adel Al Maout, who's a well-known uh, Syrian designer, so that's the third in the series, and he started a, a graphic design school in Damascus, and he was very influential in in teaching design and as a designer working for theater, and um, and so forth, and doing a lot of identities and poster designs, and he did a lot of experiments that you can see here with with lettering. So he was really free. He worked like an artist, you know, cutting letters, playing with them, drawing them in whichever way they want, and kind of following the graphic language of his illustrations. So he makes an illustration and builds the text with it. So this is a you know really beautiful to see. And sometimes you find like books from the 1950s or 60s where they use his fonts. I don't know if he designed these books or not, but they were on these book covers and they were imitated or whatever. But that was the idea of like, this is the modern thing. 
If you do that today, you probably end up in jail. <laughs> Type designers don't like these kind of experiments. But I think it's important to see um, what I find interesting in, in, in the work is not whether this, this is fantastic work or not, but I find the attitude really important that you have the freedom and to experiment and to explore and to, to have fun doing design and not worry so much about you know, other things. Um, this is a work of uh, this book. The fourth one was on the Al Azawi, who's a well known art, fine artist, actually, a uh, visual artist, painter, and sculptor from Iraq. But he also worked for a period as a designer, um, not for others, but his own work and with other collaborating with others and created posters that were motivated by you know, cultural um, <clears throat> intentions. So what I find interesting also with Azawi is that, you know, he's, he's making paintings and etchings, but they are also made of letters and words. So he wove poetry into his, his work. And for me, this is very interesting graphic uh, visual language that is unique to an artist and that we, we, we see coming back also. Like I see it now in the new generation, which makes me very um, excited about, you know, the future of design in the region. Um, then we look at uh, somebody like uh, Camille Hawa, who is the fifth in the in the series, and we talk about you know his his he's a, he's a Lebanese designer, but he actually started his his career or his not started his career, but built his first studio in Saudi Arabia, Al Muhtarab Al Saudi was called. And he had uh, part of it was in Beirut. And so it's, it's interesting to look also at his work because he was very much interested in, in making out of need fonts for his uh, branding projects. But eventually he became totally in, involved in making lettering and making uh, type, type for his studio with, with other people collaborating with him. But also he was very interested in the visual language of the script itself. So he started you know, in, in his recent years nowadays, he works mostly taking the Arabic script and making sculptures out of it and looking at, you know, three-dimensional things and playing with it like an artist would. Um, so this is one of his typefaces. He has a very specific opinion about, you know, what should Arabic type look like? And you can see, you know, his handwriting in, in things that this is supposed to be, you know, a big logo. I mean, it's very complex, but then you see you know, the influence of that logo type on the way they design a font, which became the font of the studio, like their own, for their own identity and for their own uh, applications. And, and he designed much more, but, you know. So this is a book about him. Then this, um, the sixth book was about Emil Menheim, who's, uh, who started as a painter, but then eventually got, you know, by necessity, got involved into designing magazines and publications for specific ideologies and making posters. And then he became totally innovative in the way he uh, redesigned newspapers and he's still a living and practicing designer. So his work is important for all the, you know, the fact that we all read the newspapers, so we don't think about, you know, we don't think about the visual language of it, but it's it kind of kind of seeps into our brains. And he's done on his own experiments and and started to also design his own titling fonts for his magazines. So that's also a um, thing. And then I want to end with uh, Salwa Raudash Air, which is the seventh in the series. The series is going on, but so far we've only printed seven. She's again a visual artist and a sculptor, but she did a lot of experiments. Um, her language is graphic in some ways, and she was very interested also using this graphic language inspired from poetry and from the Arabic script and applied it in an abstract way to her paintings. And here you see she applied, you know, the same aesthetic to making carpets, to making uh, textiles, um, to making like three dimensional uh, work sculptures, which is she's most famous for, but she also applied that aesthetic to making jewelry and to making brooches. And so it's very interesting to look also beyond just, you know, the, the graphic design. Um, uh, before I say thank you, I want to say that um, this is an ongoing project. And while we were working on it, we discovered that, you know, we don't have enough uh, women in our history. We know they existed, we know they worked, we know they were part of it, but nobody like they were either assisting someone or they were shy or I don't know, they never got the, the, the I mean, Salwa Raudashayl is an exception, maybe there's a few others, 
but they are really few compared to the men. And so I think our next project, which is next to this project, is going to be about doing a research on women designers, you know, that worked from the 1950s to day, till today. So if you know, this is a question open to all of you, and I'm, you know, I will... I would be happy to receive your emails or your suggestions. But if you know of women that have been remarkable, have done remarkable work, not just because they're women, but they have done really remarkable work within your culture, within your knowledge, um, what, then regardless of their age, um, please let us know because I'd like to know them. Like I know some people, but I don't know everybody. And I think that it, we want to work on a new research project based on that. So not so much about typography, but about women designers, and they could be typographers, graphic designers, uh, as long as they are Arab, sorry, they have to be Arab, um, and, you know, using the Arabic, or the, using the Arabic script, so not Arab uh, nationality per se. And yes, I hope I didn't talk too much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I stop sharing. Um, all right. Um, Thank you, Hoda. Thank you, everyone. Um, we love to see you guys. We have some time for Q&A. So if you can kindly have your cameras back on so Hoda can see you, you can, we can see each other and uh, that'll be really, really fabulous. There's one question in the audience. Um, um, it's from Ziad, actually. Thank you for sticking with the language. I'm proud of it. How, how did you overcome difficult Difficulties of reaching success. Oh, <laughs> um, I, yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I don't know. I mean, I never, I think the best answer would be, I never think about success. I mean, of course, we all want to do good stuff. <clears throat> we don't want to fail. But I think it comes with research and with kind of entering something that you've never done before. So like saying, okay, I'd like to have this perfect platform or this kind of free platform where I can experiment. And so you, I made it and then, but I wasn't sure it was going to be successful. I still made it. I think it's, it's, it's this, if we go over our fear of failure, we succeed because we can just keep doing the things and then getting better every time. I mean, it's never, with the, with the projects, with the research project, you, you have an idea in your head, you start, but then the question can change because the conversation changes or you discover new stuff. Um, you finish it and you think about it later. You think, well, it wasn't so great. There were some problems there. So the next time you do the project, you try to fix that problem. But of course, you fix one problem and another one comes up. You know, it's kind of life. Like it's so I don't know. Um, there are no difficulties in being successful if you do what you believe in and you keep on doing it, I think. Um, there is, um, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's a question or not, um, but uh, from Ahmad Al-Hindi, I, uh, I see a deep problem in getting back our Arabic identity to fit with these modern times on our own original terms. We feel we want to reconnect instead of getting lost, but nowadays, it's not clear how, yeah. There's a split between modern design community and the conservative community. For example, the modern one speaks English and the latter speaks Arabic and so on and so on. I'm answering the top question. How did you see regional design? There is a question that I, um, I put here myself, um, which is how do you see the future of design in the region? which was something um, kind of you brought up and I'm kind of bringing that into that how uh, moment. And I think Ahmed is kind of uh, responding to that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very good, very good question and a very difficult one to answer really. I think that, <clears throat> I mean, I, I think that we have to, I think it's, it has to be an individual choice how you connect to your own culture. I mean, I don't, I think there is, there is, um, sufficient a reason to be um, to be free and to do what you like to do but also if you feel comfortable being <clears throat> you know clinging to the roots and copying them then that's also okay like for me i think that there is i think the problem is when people start to dictate what is the right way to do things and that's that's that should not be there that i think we have come to a time where we are aware of things we should know our history but then everyone has to connect in their own way and like be inspired in their own way work with it in their own way 
So I, th- I see the future. I mean, if I don't see future, I'm not like, a, I can't see, I don't have a crystal ball, <laughs> but I can imagine that in already in the present today, there is there are people exactly like the way Ahmed described it. There are people that are very conservative that think, no, these are the rules and you cannot break them. And, but we know as creative people that rules are there to be explored and to be stretched. So you can also say, well, I don't want to break them. I just want to stretch them a little bit, or I want to find my own voice in that. And I think that I see it already. I mean, I see when I when I go on Instagram, for example, which is a great research platform in that sense, at least visual research, is that you see that there are people that are really taking all the old stuff, taking the Arabic language. You know, there's there's a going back to having uh, interviews only in Arabic or only in English. Um, sorry, only in Arabic, and to have like writing in Arabic and and kind of playing and jokes. And, and so there is a kind of mini community of Arab designers that are connecting in their own way with their own language to the Arabic language and design. So I, I see it also with the Persian community stronger even. And I find that good, but that's, you know, for me, it's also like, you don't have to exclude people if you want to go back to your own culture. For me, it's also important to keep a door open. That what we, that's why I, I go back to this idea of bilingualism. Yeah, we are speaking here in English because it's it's easier to have than people that are not, that don't speak Arabic and understand what we are talking about. Because the majority of Arabs do understand English, but the majority of non-Arabs don't understand Arabic. So I think in a way, it's also a way of keeping things open and keeping a dialogue open because, you know, we want to learn about ourselves. We want, we have proud and pride in, but we also show, should show it to other people. Like they should not not know about it. We know all about their culture, but they don't know anything about mm-hmm. ours or they don't know the right stuff about ours. So I think that's also for me, um, you can do both. There's no good or bad. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a question from Bishan. Hi, Bishan, it's good seeing you again. I'm curious if the type designers you showed were building upon existing established rules when approaching the functional type design, or if they were simultaneously developing some of these systems while approaching more modular or geometric type bases. Um, yeah, that depends. I mean, the, the type design research projects were really ba- built on sound rules. I mean, they all kind of had, uh, you know, it's not, they're not, they're not students, they're all professional designers. Some are like the first project, there were a lot of them were just starting to be type designers, but they all, of course, understood and studied the, the type that, you know, the, the Arabic script. So they, they had a pool of, of things to work from. Um, you have to keep in mind that in all these projects, everyone that was describing, that was designing the script was native to it. So if you're an Arab, you were designing the Arabic. If you were a Westerner, you were designing the Latin. There was no, it's not that, you know, there was a conversation between them and discussions about, you know, how do we, like, it's like making, a, you know, a negotiation, like, what do I do here to change to meet you a little bit closer? But there was they, they understood at least you know the basic rules and they could read this the script and understand you know or in, instinctively understand how far they can go before it became like completely nonsense. So uh, some some of the fonts were designed that are more like Nasr and more you know more like more modern Nasr, more printing Nasr if you want. Some were calligraphic, so that you need to know better about calligraphy and practice it a little bit. Some of them were geometrical, and that also exists. You know this kind of lettering in the Arabic tradition, in the Arabic calligraphic tradition. So it depends on what you know what what each designer was working on. The design, the graphic designer, like somebody like uh, Abdul Adir and Naoud, I think he was working like a graphic artist. I mean, he did not follow the rules of calligraphy. That's very clear. But his fonts are still readable because he is an Arab and he knows how to read Arabic and he knows how far you can go and not go. I hope I answered it. Um, we have time for one more question, and this is from Zaina al um, uh, Zaina, I love your lecture. It was really inspiring. You said earlier in your lecture that the Arabic typography has become a moder- 
so modern that instead of using old Arabic typefaces, we're actually starting from scratch. Do you think it would be better if we take our old Arabic typography and modernize it instead of creating one? Um, I don't think it's better. I think that we, what I meant by old Arabic calligraphy, I meant, you know, the, not calligraphy, I meant not very old either. I meant the, the fonts that were designed in the 1950s and that were designed often for like typesetting with metal or, um, and they were kind of a bit based on the calligraphy, but a bit wooden also. Um, like very strict and they had to follow very strict um, technical conditions. So in that sense, I think they have a kind of charm because they are from that period. Like they come, you know, they come with kind of memories and charm. But if you really look closer at them, what is being developed today, that's far more in the technology allows you to be far more creative. And so you can go a lot more calligraphic, you can do a lot more experiments. So it's not that people are starting from scratch, but they are, they are if they looking back, they're looking back at calligraphy and not at these fonts from that period, because these fonts from that period, it's like trying to, it's like trying to uh, keep on using typewriter font, you know, maybe that's an aesthetic that works for something, but not for everything. So it's, it's that what I meant. And, and one lastly, it's from Fahad. Uh, uh, Fahad, uh, hello, love, love, uh, Hoda, lovely to see you. Just a quick question. You visited Kuwait many times. Please kind, kindly share your experience and if possible, um, kindly share your expert opinion on bilingual and Arabic signage designs here in Kuwait. Have you considered working a type matchmaking project specifically in or for in and for Kuwait? Um. Is that an invitation? <laughs> yes, I would be interested. <laughs> yes, I would be interested. I don't, I mean, I, I have visited Kuwait, that's true. And I, um, but I also find that a lot of the, the type, you know, a lot of typography on signage is precisely these fonts that I was talking about. They kind of still like old fashioned and from a, a 1950s because people are just, they say, well, that's what we're used to reading. But you know, if you look at the sign, street signs, the old street signs in Cairo, for example, that were really hand, uh, you know, kind of standardized and handwritten for a while by uh, very skilled calligraphers, they are beautiful. They have a lot of personality. They have a lot of character. They're really well drawn. So I think that sometimes we have to decide, you know, what is old and what is, you know, there's old, good old and not good old, you know, and there is, so I think, that if, um, you know, the signs, especially street, you know, signage for, 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 for highways, I mean, that has to also follow all sorts of directives that have to do with safety and legibility and so forth. And sometimes I think that uh, for a lot of people, they decide that what they're used to reading most is the most legible, but sometimes it's not. Like, I don't think these bold... Uh, wooden nasks are really very legible. I'm sure that they can come up with better ones. So yes, it would be great, but that's something that you have to start by, you know, inviting somebody like from the government to a talk like this, or maybe just making an event for them and you know having this discussion and involving uh, maybe also like the older generations of Kuwaiti uh, Kuwaiti calligraphers that have you know something to say. I mean, you have what fantastic museums of calligraphy in Kuwait, so you know, there's a wealth of resources that, that somebody can be inspired from and can talk about. So yes, it would be wonderful to do a project like that. So maybe and, in the future. And Hora, lastly, um, what, what um, tip or suggestion or advice you have for some of our students that are here tonight? Uh, learn... Um, yeah, learn to learn learn as much as you can about your own culture. Learn as much as you can about other cultures, and try to do things that feel right for you and experiment and be free. Not and don't be afraid that you know you have to make the perfect design. There is no perfect design. Mm -hmm. That's that's why <laughs> by saying that it just gives a sense of relief and a release that it's okay. Let's just do it. So. Yeah. 
do it mm. and see where it takes you. And then if it's not good, then you change it. You know, life is very long, often, at least these days. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Hoda, for accepting our invitation to be here with us tonight. Um, this kind of ends our last um, uh, Type Cal from Home talk for the season. It's very hot in Kuwait, so we're off for the summer. Summer started <laughs> in March, by the way, here. Um, so um, you can follow us on Instagram and at Type Cal. Um, TypeCal Kuwait. Our website is typecal.com and we kindly invite you to go to our YouTube channel where you can also watch any of our recordings that um, we've had with amazing speakers this past year. And we really would love for you to just press that like or heart button on YouTube. So keep pressing on it as many times <laughs> as you can. <laughs> So that'll be your homework. <laughs> and, um, and please, um, you will be receiving a, um, like a feedback or a survey. Um, kindly, um, we love to hear from you. Any suggestions you may have, um, stay connected with us. Um, Hoda, I hope to ha have you with us again back in September, October, okay. maybe. And, and also, if you have, if you know of any Arab um, designers um, that you can think of, please um, either share with us or connect with uh, uh, Huda directly um, through your email. So keep that in mind. Put it out there. Put it out there. Exactly. Put thank you very there. much for, for being good listening. And thank you for inviting me to be your last speaker for this season. It feels like a really great honor. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here tonight. Have a nice morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.